perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. People throughout the world are hoping for better times. We hear it all the time. Our seasons in South Africa are now turning. We have had a long, cold and wet winter and everybody is wishing and hoping for the return of summer, for sunshine and warmer weather. It is simply human nature to want to see a better day. Everybody would like to see the end of the pandemic and to have our society return to normal and for there to be better times. Everyone would like to eliminate poverty and disease and crime and all of those things that plague our culture. But I have to be a prophet of doom and to speak the truth. There is not going to be a better day, but a worse one. A better day is not coming. What is coming is a terrible, eternal tragedy. The world of the future will not be a utopia, but the inhabitants of the earth will feel the fury of God's judgment like no one else has ever felt it. Things are not going to get better. They are going to get infinitely worse. As we reach this part of Revelation chapter 14, it will become clear to us that these passages record the judgment of God to come. Starting at verse 6, we encounter three angels. While their messages are messages of judgment, they do contain elements of grace, hope and salvation. But the doom of the world is clear. Angels are always involved in the actions and work of God. They were involved in the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. That can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 33 verses 1 to 3. Angels have been involved in caring for believers. That can be found in Hebrews 1 verses 14. And during the last days, angels will be very involved as well. They have a major role to play in God's final judgment. For example, in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13, Jesus Christ explains to his disciples that angels will be the reapers who will gather people at the end for judgment, as well as gathering believers into the kingdom. In this passage, in Revelation chapter 14, we find that the angels are not involved so much in judgment or gathering believers, but angels are busy speaking and delivering messages. There are three particular angels mentioned in verses 6 through 11, and each of them has a message to deliver from God. Here is a little bit of Bible trivia. In the book of Revelation, angels are mentioned and active in every chapter from chapter 4 through to 14, with the exception of chapter 13. So they are very, very involved in the activities and the messages of the end times. By the end of chapter 14, you will see that there are seven angels in total, but the first three are linked closely together. The role that they play here is not the role of judgment, but the role of warning. Let us see what these angels have to say in Revelation 14 verses 6 to 11. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up for ever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. The first angel's message speaks of an eternal gospel, that is, the everlasting gospel. We learn from the angel's words that it is the gospel of creation, where nature itself shows that God exists. People are told to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Nature itself is the witness that no one can miss, because it is revealed all around us. Psalm 19 verses 1 to 2 says that, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. We are part of nature. Our own nature witnesses that there is a God. 
Nature is everywhere testifying to the existence and the glory of God. What nature tells us is that there is a God and you cannot live without Him. He gives you the ability to breathe and to think. Paul said this to the Athenians in Acts 17 verses 24 to 28. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. So, this eternal gospel declares, since there is a God and you cannot exist without him, therefore worship him. It is the fundamental cry of nature. Hebrews 11 verses 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. Romans 1 verses 19 declares the same fact that what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. So this becomes the basis for the ultimate judgment of mankind. God will say in effect to people in that day, If you knew that I was essential to you, why did you not worship me? That will be the gospel by which men will be judged when the hour of his judgment comes. The second angel's message is found in Revelation 14 verses 8. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. This is the first mention in Revelation of Babylon the great, which will appear in more detail in chapters 17 and 18. It is the woman who rides the beast that we refer to briefly back in chapter 13, during episode 43 of this podcast. Babylon the Great is, as we shall see when we come to those chapters, the false church, that which professes to be Christian but really is not, the church that does go through the Great Tribulation. Before it appears, God wants us to know that it is treacherous and adulterous, and it will fall in a short while. The third angelic message appears in Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11. Another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulphur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. In episode 44, I spoke about how the Antichrist will exert economic control of the whole world and said that the Revelation 13 details how no one will be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast imprinted on the back of the hand or on the forehead. According to this passage, the angel announces this is a fatal choice. Anyone who receives this mark shall experience the fury of God's wrath to its full strength. These words are what is often called hellfire and brimstone preaching. Today, in the circles of liberal theology, this is regarded as offensive and contrary to the gospel of love. But all through the Bible, you see that God's love is manifest to men everywhere by urging them to escape this judgment. God in love pleads with people, do not go down this road. However, in the end, he must ultimately judge those who refuse his offer of grace. When dealing with mankind's sin and rebellion, God has three choices. Firstly, God can let rebellion go on forever and never judge it. In this case, the terrible things that are happening on earth, all the injustice, the cruelty, the anger, the hate, the malice, the sorrow, the hurt, the pain, the death that now prevails will go on forever. God does not want that, and neither does man. Secondly, God can force men to obey him and control them as robots. But he will never do that because that means they cannot love him. Love cannot be forced or coerced from someone. Thirdly, the only choice God really has left is that he must withdraw ultimately from those who refuse his love. He must let them have their own way forever. 
that will result in the terrible torment of godlessness. If God is necessary to us, then to take him out of our lives is to plunge us into the most terrible sense of loneliness and abandonment that mankind can know. This is what hell really is, the total absence of God. Now, once again in the midst of this frightening and depressing scene, the believers of that day are encouraged in verses 12 to 13 of chapter 14. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. The believers of that day are told to endure, which is a decision not to yield at any point or to give way to the glorification of man in that day. Notice that after this difficult instruction, John is told to write something special down for these people. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Why does he add, from now on? Aren't all the dead who die in the Lord blessed? There is a special reason why John is told to add the words, from now on. It is because the believers of that day would feel as if they have missed out on the resurrection. At this point of time in Revelation, the church has already been removed out of the world, some by resurrection and some by transformation, and these believers know this. Those that once were here have gone suddenly, transformed by the Lord Jesus himself, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, we shall be changed. To those believers who are on earth after that, they will be troubled by the thought that when they die, they will not be sure that they will be included in the resurrection, for it is already past. This was exactly the same problem that the Thessalonian Christians faced when Paul wrote his first letter to them. They thought that when their loved ones died, they would miss the rapture because they saw that event as the removal or rapture of the living believers. They had written to Paul about it and he had answered them in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 17. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So these believers of the last days are given a special reassurance of the Spirit. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. They too may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. In Revelation 14 verses 14 to 16, the scene changes. In the last podcast, we learned that the 144,000 from the tribes of Israel are the first fruits of the harvest of the last days. If these 144,000 are the first fruits, then the rest of the harvest comes now. Then I looked, and behold a white cloud, and seated on the cloud one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Who is this one seated on the cloud, like a son of man, wearing a victor's crown and holding a sickle in his hand? It is the Lord Jesus. He mentions this himself in the parable of the wheat and the weeds in Matthew 13 verses 24 to 30 and 13, 36 to 43. In the parable, the servants had asked the Lord, Then do you want us to go and pull the weeds out? But he said to them, No, lest in gathering the wild wheat, weeds resembling wheat, you root up the true wheat along with it. Let them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time 
I will say to the reapers, Gather the darnel first and bind it in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my granary. Jesus interpreted that parable to the disciples, telling them that the harvest is the end of the age, which is the seven-year period that we are dealing with in Revelation, and the reapers are the angels. This agrees exactly with what we have here. The angels announce that the time of harvest has come, and the words of Jesus in Matthew 13 will be literally fulfilled. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. There is still another scene of harvest in the Revelation 14 verses 17 to 20. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Is this the same story of harvest repeated? No. You will notice the first harvest is a harvest of wheat. It is cut with a sickle, and it is a separation of the true wheat from the false wheat or weeds, which is called darnel. Darnel looks like wheat at first, but it is not when it matures. As we have seen, the angels will separate the two. The second harvest is a grape harvest. The vine in scripture is frequently a symbol of Israel. The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 5, uses this symbol, describing Israel as a vine brought out of Egypt and planted in a land cared for by God himself. Psalm 80 refers to the same thing. Israel is a vine brought out of Egypt. At the Last Supper, the Lord Jesus himself said, I am the true vine, and you are the branches, speaking of his Jewish disciples. As a symbol of Israel, the winepress describes the judgment of apostate Israel. Just like the so-called Christian nations of today, most of the present nation of Israel does not believe in scriptures. Many of them are atheists. Many of them deny the word of God in the Old Testament, or it applies to them as a special people at all. This harvest is therefore the judgment of apostate Israel. It is called in Jeremiah 30 verses 7, the time of Jacob's trouble. It will be a time of warfare once again against Israel beginning with an invasion of the nation by great armies from the north. Palestine will be overrun. It is at this time when the woman, or the true Israel, whom we saw in chapter 12, will flee to hide in the desert. Apostate Israel will be destroyed, and Jerusalem will be sacked and partially destroyed. You can read that in Zechariah 14. The prophet Joel also describes it in Joel 3 verses 12 to 13. This is the same scene as we have here. Notice in verse 20 that there is a change from a symbol to a literal meaning. Grapes are thrown into the wine press, which is a symbol, but blood pours out. That is the literal meaning of press grapes or wine. When we look at the Lord's Supper, we know that wine symbolizes the blood of Christ for us. But here, blood covers the land for 1,600 stadia, or 290 kilometers, which is the entire length of Israel. This is a terrible scene of judgment. Hebrews 10 verses 31 declares that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. What a frightening future the world has, and the world doesn't know it, but we know it. We know where the world is going, and it is not a lucky guess, as it is all here in the book of Revelation. We have the information that we must share. We already know that the house is on fire and that judgment awaits. We know what is coming and we have got a world full of people trying to figure out the future. We know the future and the responsibility to tell others. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 46. Mm -hmm.